And okay, we'll go ahead and get going here. And so um, one of the things I wanted to do is go through the uh, uh, who's COPEC again. Uh, COPEC is a nonprofit 501c3 organization that allows us to really get this information out. And um, we do this with no cost and no uh, sales or product promotion. Um, it's real important that we provide this to the community and make sure that you guys have a resource to go to, to uh, if you have questions, uh, directions, clarification, uh, any of those things. So we're happy to provide this. You can see over on the right side, uh, we have quite a bit of uh, speakers that are available uh, for these programs. Every day we do a daily show and then on Fridays we do this lecture series. So um, please keep tuning in. We really appreciate you guys attending and look forward to having you ongoing. Um, the uh, technology, obviously, uh, being financial advisors, I'm, I'm, we're not the most uh, proven experts in the technology field, but we'll continue to do what we can. Sometimes there's a break in technology or in connectivity, and we'll make sure we get that up and running as soon as possible. Um, also, feel free to share this with others. We, we'd love to have you and uh, have them participate as well. Um, being that this is a lecture series, it's not going to be a conversation as much as a lecture, but feel free if you do have any comments or questions, uh, go ahead and uh, put those in the chat or the uh, Q&A and I'll try to get to those as best I can. So just a, another review with uh, some of the other on the COPEC website, obviously the Daily Show. Uh, this is uh, again today at two o'clock. And we'll have, if you look here on the 14th, we're going to have Russ Gollowin. He's going to um, log in and he's uh, be our speaker for the day and our, our guest. And we're going to talk a little bit about estate planning. So hopefully that all works well and you guys can join us. And then um, coming up here in September, we actually, today we're kind of doing 10 years out, but this is a, a retirement decisions workshop. Historically, we've been doing this about 15 years, and this is in person, Fossil Center libraries, obviously with COVID and, and things uh, making it a little bit difficult. The libraries have been canceled, but the in person uh, with uh, 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 social distancing and masks, we are planning on still having it at the Fawcett Center in September. Uh, this does require registration. So if it's something you're interested in attending, same rules apply. There's no cost. There's no sales and marketing, and we would love to have you join us. And then obviously today we have the Financial Wellness Fridays. Take a look at the calendar of the ongoing programs that we have and uh, tune in when you can and we'd love to have you. This area here, if you happen to be an organizer of wellness within your community, your department, your company, and you'd like to have a speaker or one of our programs either in person or uh, web-based, uh, let us know on this site and uh, we're happy to go ahead and be part of your outreach and uh, participate in the education. And then lastly, if you've got personal questions or concerns uh, that we can't deal with today, again, use chat, use the uh, Q&A um, and let us know. But if you'd like to actually have a more thorough conversation that's a little more private, uh, feel free to schedule a 15 minute consultation with one of our advisors and we can definitely uh, help set you on the right path and get you where you need to go. So with no further ado, uh, retirement planning. Now, it's an interesting process whenever you deal with different time frames for different age groups. Um, there are basically, if you're in your 20s and 30s and even your 40s, trying to go ahead and making sure that you're keeping your mind on this big long term goal that everybody has. Obviously, we have other goals. You know, we, we raise a family, uh, purchase a home, maybe paying off um, with. Uh, you know, debt and college and all the different things that we deal with in our lives. And so uh, it's real important to make sure you always keep that, that long-term goal in mind. Now, in, in, uh, when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, you're usually worried about those other goals, but saving, just getting 401ks and 403bs and retirement plans set up. And so at some point, you want to go ahead and make sure that you really start focusing on what that retirement looks like and what are the tools and resources and income that you're dealing with. And so, you know, as we get into that, that thought process, it's real important to make sure that you imagine what that looks like. So what, I, what I'm really interested in right now, we have some time here to give you a few, 
you know, let's do a full uh, 60 seconds, let's say. I want you to just take a minute and just think and feel and imagine what your retirement would look like after you're done with your employment. I want you to just close your eyes, focus, and yeah, and, um, and just think about it and make sure that it's, you know, whether you're traveling or spending time with family, what is it that you're thinking about? So I'm gonna give you a minute. I want to just nice and quiet, just think about that. Now through the chat, if anybody has any thoughts or responses that you want to put in there, um, what are some of the things that you you feel that you've uh, really you know visualized yourself doing? And uh, if you want to put that in there, and if we can get some people, and then if not we'll keep moving but again i hope you're sitting there thinking about those things that are really important to you now the key is is how do you get that how do you make sure that you have the finances to do the things that you want to do and have that kind of retirement the way that you want to do it and so um and so uh you know making sure that you set up that process that gives you the means and the ability, the health, right? The health is a big thing that a lot of people talk about, making sure you have the ability to do what you want. Uh, you obviously, financial wealth. And so uh, it's important to, to think that all through. So we're gonna keep going here. Now to do that, we really need to think about a lot of things. First of all, implementing a plan, um, we need to start now. It doesn't matter where you are in that age group, you need to really start on it, especially if you're getting into those 50s uh, range and you've got 10, 15 years uh, before you get into retirement. At that time, you can not only start visualizing what it could be, but you start seeing it gel as far as what resources you, you have. Um, do you have a lot of assets? Do you have a pension? What kind of social security? Um, do, you know, where you plan on living, you already kind of know what your family looks like. So there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle that are really coming out at this time. Um, crunching the numbers. Obviously, being financial advisors, that's what we do for our clients. We really crunch the numbers. A lot of people can do this themselves as well. Um, many times the software systems and things like that make it a lot easier excuse me, a lot easier. And there's nice basic systems that are available through most people's retirement plans, like their 401k, 403b, um, or other things. But at least if you start crunching that numbers, you have an idea as to what that might look like. And then tax advantage retirement vehicles, those are the 401ks, 403bs, uh, 457 plans, IRAs, that give you the best chance to accumulate wealth especially while you're working in a higher tax bracket with the idea that if you can put money into retirement and not pay taxes at a higher bracket and then in retirement pull it back out in a lower bracket you really benefit on a tax savings there annuities um don't get into annuities too much uh annuities are a, a, an interesting um investment for people and there's a lot of uniquenesses and specialties there that if you purchase an annuity you really want it to be for a specific reason and so we'll get into that a little bit but basically if you have been thinking about or have annuities you want to make sure that you've reviewed it maybe get a third party analysis and make sure it's doing exactly what you want it to do um, because it can be costly but it can do some great things as far as making you feel comfortable and protected during, uh, during retirement. And then investment considerations of protecting against risk. So obviously investment considerations. And, th and for those of you that have paid attention to a lot of our different programs, um, there, there's a lot that we talk about with investments, risk tolerances, uh, goal setting, having investments tied to each goal, uh, but also the protecting against undue risk, which is, you know, like, what happens if you if, if your health fails? You know what happens if you get disabled? 
what happens if you pass away and you're the breadwinner? What about your family? So some of those things are real important to think about as well. Um, starting now, you know, this is a generic um, uh, piece of information, but I always like to reemphasize it. And the reason why I like to is what this shows is that if you put it off and the value of putting, you know, starting today, which is the younger you are, if you just start doing a little bit, it will grow. And especially as you go, it doesn't seem like a lot. So that's $3,000 per year at 6%. And if you started at age 20, you look how it grew to 679,000 and that's only 3,000 a year. Now the key that I really wanna look at though is on the right side of the blue line, I want you to see how that's starting to go up more vertical. And the interesting thing there is as it goes more vertical, you really start having your money work for you as much as you did in saving in these plans. And that's that compounding return effect. Um, you notice the, you know, the red line where you started at age 45, that one, it's pretty flat. Most of that 120,000 is just the money you put in with some earnings. But it eventually with the blue line, those earnings earn off of each other. And so for those that are younger and you're really thinking about this, don't minimize the fact that that compounding benefit really is a dynamic benefit for your long-term planning. Now, the reality is for people that are 20, you're more worried about college, you're more worried about starting a family and buying a house. And I, you know, everybody gets that. And the reality is if you didn't save until you're 45, chances are at 45, you're not putting in 3,000, you're putting in 10 or 20,000 or more. And so you're making it up because maybe you earn more at that point, whatever it is. But the point of this is that a small amount over a long period of time can have a dramatic effect. Uh, basic considerations, we, you know, we talked about this a little bit at the beginning of, you know, what kind of retirement do you want? We, you know, I've been doing this just shy of 30 years, and we deal with a lot of people who, who say that, um, well, I'm glad I was able to set this up the way I wanted to, and I wasn't sure about it, or, wow, I wish I would have something. I wish I would have looked at this 10 years ago, or I wish I would have set this up so that I can have the type of retirement I want. And, and usually it has to do with budget and health, like I mentioned before. Um, and so making sure that you have those variables under control as best as possible as you go into those retirement years. When do you wanna retire? How long will that retirement last? So we're gonna go into each of these a little bit here. Again, back to what kind of retirement you want. Financial independence is key. Um, a lot of times we as financial advisors, we try to differentiate the difference between retirement planning or financial independence. Actually, let me re rephrase that. Financial independence analysis and retirement date. So a lot of times people, when they work in, in, a, in a nine to five type job where they, let's say they even had a pension, it was always like, I'm gonna retire when I have full pension. Well, okay, just because you have full pension doesn't mean that pension's enough to satisfy your need in retirement. So what we really, or even age 65, right? We talk about this all the time. I'm gonna retire at 65. Okay, are you financially independent? So the act of retirement, which is no longer working, is not always synonymous with financial independence. So if you're, if you're a, a wealthy 25 year old and you've got $50 million from inheritance or whatever it might be, you're financially independent. Now, if you wanna work, you can work. If you don't wanna work, you don't have to, but you're financially independent. Whereas if you're 75 years old and you're what they would call living on a fixed income, which typically means what? You're, li you're typically living on social security and that's it. Do you have enough money? Well, you're retired, but you're not financially independent to live the way you wanna live. And so it's really clear that you over, and I mean over analyze this and make sure that you have accounted for um, the success of that financial independence all the way through retirement after you decide to retire. Um, 
freedom to travel, pursue hobbies. A lot of times people, when they retire, they visualize that they're doing all these other things. Well, guess what? It costs money. It costs more money than while you're working maybe. And a lot of times people spend a lot of money when they have their family, but then they pull back a little bit, maybe not. And then when they retire, they're like, you know what? I've always wanted to do the trips to Alaska. I would, you know, trips here and I wanted to travel the world or whatever it is that they want to do, buy a second home uh, in Florida or, you know, Arizona or at the lake or whatever it might be, these cost money. And so you need to make sure that you, you finance that and figure out how you're going to do that. And don't retire until you've figured that out. The ability to live where you want, current home, new home, second home. We just talked about that a little bit. An opportunity to provide financially for children or grandchildren. Um, a lot of times people say, you know, wow, whew, my kids are out of the house. They're doing a good job. And, you know, they're on, you know, they're on their own and you know, I'll be there for them and things like that. And uh, then all of a sudden they have grandkids and all of a sudden the pocketbook open, opens back up again. And they weren't aware of how much money they wanted to spend. Not that they had to maybe, but they wanted to maybe pay for the, the, the entire family trip or, I mean, you, there's a lot of ways that people do different things. But, you know, giving gifts and caring for them and taking them out and doing different things, you know, you, you just figure out what your situation may look like. And even though you're not spending it today, it doesn't mean you won't spend it in the future or want to spend it in the future. So it's really key to think that, that through. Um, so when do you want to retire? The earlier you retire, the shorter the period of time you have to accumulate funds. So let's go back to this picture here, uh, this picture here. So let's say that you are age, uh, you know, 35, but you want to retire at 55. Well, you just chopped or lopped off that whole last 10 years worth of compounded growth and, and savings rate. So it is obviously real important to make sure that if, um, if your goal is to retire early, that you, self, that you do a self-assessment of where you are, what you think your savings rates will be, and shoot for that target. A lot of times people that don't, some people say, oh, I'm just gonna work till 65 no matter what, whatever the number is. Whereas other people say, you know what, this is a high stress job. I don't really like it, or I like it, but it's just, it's just I can't, I, I just know I can't do this all the way to 65. I want to try to retire at 55. Well, if you plan for 55 and you're really honest with yourself, well, what's, what's the worst case scenario? Is that 55, when the goal hits, you're, you, you, let's say you failed that goal. Well, maybe you only can retire at 58. Well, it's still better than what you would have done at 65. So for those that really want to become financially, in, and that's an example there where that person, they would love to retire at 55, but because they were not officially and, and confirmed financially independent, they don't retire at 55, they wait until they're financially independent. And that may be 58. Maybe they add variables so that they can retire that they normally wouldn't have done. For example, I want to financially I want to retire at 55 and be financially independent. Well, I don't want to work part time from 55 to 65. Well, then all of a sudden you get to 55 and you're not financially independent, but you really don't like your job. And I'm not saying anybody out there doesn't like their job, but in case that was a scenario where it just, it just doesn't match up and you're talking, whatever the reason is. And all of a sudden you're like, I'm 55. I'm not financially independent, but guess what? I didn't put in part-time work and I didn't do these certain other things. If I went out and worked for 10 years at a flower shop, at a car garage, at a, at a Walmart, whatever it is, and all of a sudden now you make another X amount of dollars for 10 years doing something you love to do that's, that's you know, comfortable. And, you know, and I know I've got some clients where they, they love to golf, so they, their part-time job is working at a golf course because not only do they make some money working at the golf course, then they get to golf for free or a discount. So they saved on expenses and they, they made a little bit of extra. All of a sudden, now the plan works. So it's all about tweaking and moving a lot of these numbers to fit what your situation is. 
Um, just a couple of reminders. Social Security is not available till 62. It is discounted um, at age 62. Full retirement is typically around 66 to 67. And you can defer all the way up till 70, which you would get extra, you know, a little bit higher benefit um, all the way through 70 as well. In our retirement decisions workshop in September, uh, we will actually dig into this stuff a lot more uh, detailed. I'll go over some of it, but, uh, and then Medicare uh, eligibility starts at 65. So again, for that person that wants to retire at 55, what are you doing for healthcare? Does your company have healthcare? Would they provide it to you if you retire as a gap to 65? Do you have to go out and buy something? Um, so making sure you cover those costs and then obviously at 65, it would drop down, maybe get a Medicare supplement at that time. And those things make it um, predictable so that you can cover those, those variables. And then on the, on the back end is how long will retirement last? You know, the, here, the average 65 year old can expect to live another 19, let's just say 20 years. Age 85, now, back in the day when you got uh, Social Security, you worked nine to five, you retired at 65, but the average life, when Social Security started, the average life expectancy was like 69. You know, and so not only is that undue pressure on Social Security, the fact that we're living 20 years longer, which is great, don't get me wrong, but it puts a lot of undue pressure, extra pressure on us as individuals to make sure we have the assets that are there for age 85, just as it was there for age 66. And unfortunately, too many times, if you don't do good analysis on this, um, we see people struggle in those last years with finances. And that's not what we want our clients to go through. We do not want you to struggle those last one or two years when you need the, the, um, the assets to make it more comfortable and, and get the care you need and whatever it might be. And so the average life expectancy is likely uh, to continue to increase. Nobody knows what the future holds, um, but the fact that it's gone up as much as it has over the last 50 years, 75 years, has been really interesting to watch, of course. And then um, it may last 25 years or more. If you retire at 62 and lived, you know, I, I've, got, uh, I've got family that are in their 90s. Um, you know, and, and so if you retire to 60, you know, that's 30 years. So it's very likely um, that uh, 20 to 30, you know, a third of your life in retirement, let's say, it's very possible depending on what your situation is. Um, now, crunching the numbers, estimate retirement is really key. It is important that we always look at um, uh, the numbers. Sometimes people have feelings. They feel that things are good or they're bad or whatever it might be. And when you look at them, they're like, oh, it's not as bad. Or, oh my gosh, it's way worse. And it's real important to really look at the numbers. And if you're not a numbers person, have somebody do this for you and have them explain it and understand it and tweak it. Because a lot of times with the numbers, some numbers, when you tweak it like financial independence, you may move this number and it doesn't change your long-term projections very much at all. But if you change this one, it, it, it changed your projections dramatically. And it's important for you to know which of those variables that you have to be super careful with and which of the variables doesn't matter as much. Let me give you an example. We had a client where when we were doing these projections, they, uh, let's use that 55 year old to 58 year old. They really wanted to leave at 55. And they said, well, that's okay. I can go work part time. Well, it sounds like they're adding a variable and it'll have a huge impact. Whereas if they worked one more year at their employer, what kind of impact would that have? Well, surprisingly, after they look at it, Working two more years at their current employer, the way it was set up in their situation, did more for them than working 10 years part-time. Now, if you just can't do those two years, I get it. But that's a dramatic you know, impact. Obviously, depending on what your income is, what your benefits are, and all those things. So a lot of times, people will put in those extra years of work. The other is expenses. Hey, I want to do this and I want to travel and I want to buy a new car every two years and I want to this and I want to that and all these things. And then realize 
realizing that if they cut out this and cut out this and cut out that, all of a sudden they're financially independent. I'm not saying to cut out things because you really want to save, but if you really want to make that financial independence transition, now, you need to make sure that you follow those cutouts. You can't say, I'm going to retire with these variables gone, but then all of a sudden you put them back in and you're, you're not sure why you ran out of money. So you got to be very practical about that, but it's really interesting. So when you're crunching the numbers on income, it's real important to look at your uh, gap. And that's what we really focus on with a lot of clients is what is your expenses? Now we need to fine tune that. More, um, more retirement plans fail because they didn't stick to an expense structured budget. Um, and then what is your retirement income? And typically retirement income, when they use this example, it is tied to a pension or social security. So if you're in a private company that has a pension or if you have um, federal social security or if you have uh, FERS or if you have a state pension like OPRS or STRS, those are all this income, this base income. Now, some of those you can take lump sums. So you have to decide whether you want the, the guaranteed income pension or the lump sum assets. And that's a whole nother discussion. But if you are assuming a certain income, um, what is that income? And then identify the gap. And we'll show you that in here in a second. And then calculate the retirement investment goal that you need to supplement it. And then make sure you account for inflation. Inflation is another really big impactful uh, variable that people don't assess enough. Because again, hey, my money makes it okay now at 66. But if your costs double with a three and a half percent inflation, it'll double in 20 years. Well, it, when you're 85, if you were living off of 60,000, but at age 85, you needed 120,000 because of inflation and your pensions weren't growing and your investments weren't growing because you're too conservative or whatever it might be, you may run out of money because you didn't properly account for inflation and make sure you include that um, in those future expenses. General guidelines, 60 to 90% of pre-retirement income is what you need. Well, this is an easy guideline, but often not very helpful. It's kind of like saying average. The average height of a male is five foot eight. Well, if you're six foot, what does, the, what does average mean? It doesn't affect me at all unless you happen to be average or unless you happen to fall within these guidelines. And 60 to 90% is such a, so don't use guidelines. Sometimes it's fun using guidelines to get a point across, but be very specific and to your personal situation. And make sure when you talk about crunching expenses that you're specific to you. Don't use guidelines and use that as a safe way. I actually find in, 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 in our company here, that most people actually spend more in retirement than what they did. So the idea that if you earned, you know, sixty thousand dollars, whatever the number is, it does, let's use a hundred because it's an easy number. You earned a hundred thousand dollars in retirement, or while you're working, and in retirement that you're going to live off of sixty. That may be the situation, but what if you? What if you're earning 60, but you want to enjoy retirement more? Well, chances are you're not going to be at 60. You may be at 70 or 80. Um, it really is across the board, but it's real important to understand we find a lot of times people spend the same or more in retirement. It's on different things, more travel, less you know, things that they would normally use for a business and whatever it might be. But just be careful about that. And then um, they change mortgage may decrease, but healthcare may increase, travel may increase. Um, you wanna do those big trips versus the small trips when you were younger or whatever it might be. Um, you know, sleeping in a camper or a tent or a hostel, whereas when you're in retirement, you're getting really nice hotels. You know, it's even something simple as that, you know, convenience and luxury or whatever, whatever you're looking for. And then hobbies. Um, I think hobbies is a big one. People, you need to keep busy, volunteering, things like that. But if you're doing these things, and maybe you're doing it more than when you were working even, well, it takes money. It takes, it takes, it takes, it takes uh, an investment. 
you know, my father is a good example of this. He loves building re remote control airplanes and he sells them and he flies them and does those things. Next thing you know, he's like, I bought these two and I bought, the, you know, and all that stuff. He didn't have time to do that before, but now he does. So just think of those hobbies and, and uh, volunteering as well. And then the, the, the known three-legged stool. Sometimes people use four-legged stool. Um, I really like the three and sticking with the Social Security, your private pension or your state pension, but then your savings. Because sometimes people say the four-legged stool because they separate out 401k from your own personal accounts outside of a, a company retirement plan. That's still your savings. Whether the company provides it and doesn't match, it's still you putting money in usually and providing that savings rate. So you can think of it, Social Security, pension, and then 401k and other investments. Some people have property, some people, whatever it might be, bank accounts. And it's that third one that is really critical for most people hitting their target. So Social Security is pretty well locked in. You know what that's gonna be. If you have a pension, some people decide they don't want that pension in an income format, and they may convert it to the third level, which is the investments. They may roll over a lump sum into an IRA. Well, that's an investment. Now you have to care for that. And so making sure you meet those and apply them. So here's an example. Let's say that this person is living off of $50,000 is the estimated annual expense in retirement. If their estimated annual income is 20,000, let's just say that's Social Security. Well, they need to make it up from either a pension or 401k or other savings for that other $30,000. Now it seems simple, but when you do this in a, in a bigger scale and recalculate this annually throughout the rest of your life, it, it gets a little bit cumbersome, but that's the basics of how it works. And then you convert that. So if you say I need 30,000 with inflation for the rest of my life from 65 to 85 or 90, we project out to 90. Well, what is the, with inflation, by the way, that 30,000 is gonna go up, especially if the 20,000 isn't gonna go up. Let me give you an example. If the 50,000 is your expenses, we all know the cost of you know, bread and whatever it is is going to go up each year, inflation. So that 50,000 need is gonna go up. Well, if your pension happens to be frozen, the 20,000, well, that means not only does your investment income need to go up with the inflation to match it, but it has to make up what the other 20,000 isn't, or even Social Security. Social Security goes up, but it, it rarely tracks with inflation. Sometimes they don't even get a cost of living increase. So it's real important to evaluate those and make sure you apply those. And then as those numbers, so that 30,000, you present value, and that's the idea that tells you, this is how much money I need. Let's say that's $384,000 then you need that 384,000 to then last you all the way out through your life expectancy. And so that's really where a lot of this analysis comes in and making sure that you're on target. And this is an example of inflation adjusted numbers. Like I said, that 50,000 is gonna go up each year, but what this is talking about is if you um, have an investment and it grows up to 395,000, applying inflation, really it's only worth 205. Sometimes we do projections where we, we look at somebody and we say, okay, you're, you're 50 years old now, you retire at 65 and you've got, you know, a million dollars, $500,000 plus a pension, whatever the number is. And all of a sudden, in, you know, at age 90, when you, when you pass away, the, the, the projections show that you have $2 million. And you're like, ooh, I've got $2 million when I'm 90. That's what I'll leave to my kids or whatever it might be. But that's a, that's a non-inflation adjusted future number. When you adjust that number, it might be worth 500,000 again. So you need to make sure you understand. It's kind of like saying, hey, you know, I'm a millionaire today. Well, it means a lot less than saying I'm a millionaire in 1960. And so it's real important to make sure you understand those, those comparisons. 
uh, tax advantage savings vehicles. I'm going to run through pretty quick here. And uh, for those that are uh, listening, if there's any particular area as I go through that you want me to expand, expound upon, please just let me know. That's not a problem whatsoever. Um, but with the tax advantage vehicles, they definitely can help you, especially when you're in a higher tax bracket, 401ks, IRAs, Roth IRAs, all of those different vehicles, because they remove many times the tax impact while you're trying to grow. And think of it this way. Imagine, imagine you're trying to row across the lake and you're rowing and doing a good job into a headwind. And that headwind is like taxes. If you remove those taxes, it is a lot easier for you to row across that lake. Just like saving for retirement, it is easier financially to build net worth if you remove as much of those current taxes from the equation as possible. Now, remember though, if you're a millionaire in a 401k, that hasn't applied taxes yet, you're, you're not necessarily a millionaire because it depends, is it net after taxes or before? But here's the key. If you're in a high tax bracket when you put it in, and then in retirement, you're in a low tax bracket, you're a lot closer to a millionaire in retirement than you were the day before you retired because you were in a higher tax bracket. So those are things that a lot of people really need to apply. And then, uh, benefit of tax deferral. This is back to what I was saying at the beginning. When you see the line going much more vertical, how it impacts or compounds on top. This is that headwind I'm talking about. If you were saving, the 38000 is if you had that headwind every year taxing you. And that's the net after taxes. But if you can tax defer through these retirement plans, it grows to fifty seven. But then even after tax, it's still 43. It's higher than what you would if you were taxed all, all the way along. So that, you know, that's a small example, but if you continue to do that for retirement, there is a, there is a compound benefit on that. And then IRAs, traditional, Roth. Um, IRAs are real important for everybody to understand. And I'm a big advocate of Roth IRAs um, especially as you get older, you got to be really careful to make sure, would you, because Roth IRAs, you don't get to deduct it going in, but it could potentially be tax free coming out. Um, but you got to be really careful to make sure, is it worth giving up that deduction for future when you can't leave it in there for 40 or 50 years like a 20 year old could? Um, but it's great to have that balance. And in addition to that, if you have a 401k and you're putting a lot of money in, into the deductible side, Many 401ks also have the Roth, but what I like people to see is maximize a lot of that 401k into the traditional deductible. And then as long as your income isn't too high, you can still contribute to a Roth IRA with other bank money. So if you have $50,000 sitting in a bank account every year, move five or $6,000 to a Roth, and now that will not be taxed going forward if you, if you do it right. Um, they're great for emergency funds. They're great to still get access to that money, even though it's growing tax deferred or tax free if you do it right. You can still access the principal you put in just like you could a savings account, a, 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 a taxable savings account. So I think those are good things for people to look at. Um, talked a little bit about here. I'm not gonna get into too much of the ages. If anybody has any questions on those, you can let me know. Uh, 59 and a half rule, 10% penalties, things like that. But again, the neat thing about the Roth again is that because it's after tax contributions, if you put in $5,000 and over the years it grew to 7,000, you can pull out the 5,000 at any time for any reason. You just can't touch the 2,000. That has to stay in there until either five years and for 59 and a half. Um, without a, you know, to not have that penalty. And this, you know, Roth IRAs makes more sense if you want to minimize taxes during retirement. And what they mean there is, you know, let's say that you're in a situation where you built some wealth and then you stopped, 
you know, heavy working. So you had some income, but then in retirement, a lot of this income is going to go up again. Or if you think that taxes are going to go up in the future, well, then maybe it's, it makes more sense to go ahead and pay the tax and put it in the Roth because you feel that you need that tax free income in the future so that you don't keep getting bumped up. And typically when people turn 70 and a half and now it's 72, um, you have to start taking a bunch of money out of your IRAs. Uh, so if you want to minimize that and be able to use the income from the, uh, from the Roth or the other, you know, non-retirement uh, accounts, it's good to balance that. We call that tax bracket management. Every chance you have, to not go up to another bracket in retirement saves you that. So let's just say it's eight or 10% going from one bracket to the next. If you, you know, if you take taxable income and you come all the way to the, the top of the one bracket and you don't go into the next and any income you need here, you take it from a Roth or a, um, a non-retirement account for your expenses, well then you didn't pay that higher marginal rate. And so managing your distributions uh, to match with uh, lower taxes is really key in retirement. And this is some contributions. I think this stopped in 2019, 2020, it goes up a little bit. It goes up a little bit every year, uh, typically. But in general, if you have a 401k, 403b, 457, you're looking at about 25 uh, plus thousand dollars that you can put in. Now, for those of you that are Ohio State University, um, you actually have what's uh, kind of a double. You're a nonprofit and a government agency. So you have a 403B and a 457 that you can save in, in addition to what you do for the state pension. Um, and the neat thing here is as you get closer to retirement, they have catch up provisions. But, you know, the more that you can contribute to that in those last, you know, five, eight years, whatever it might be, um, it, you can really get ahead on those pre-tax savings in your highest bracket. Um, 401k has Roth also, and I talked enough about that, that, that we kind of get the idea. Now, annuities. Now, one of the things I want to talk about here is just remember that an annuity is a unique um, product that is available through insurance companies. And what they basically, what it basically is, the concept is, is that you give an asset. So let's say you have a um, you know, $100,000 and you give it to the insurance company, they turn around and give you a guaranteed income for the rest of your life of $2,000 a month or $100,000 or $1,000 a month for the rest of your life or whatever the number is. That's basically what annuitization is or what an annuity is. Then on top of that, annuities have, a, have the ability to have an accumulation phase, they call it. So you can put money into these annuities with the idea that someday in the future, you're gonna convert it to a guaranteed income. So instead of giving them 100,000, maybe you put in $1,000 a month until it grows to some point, and then you annuitize that amount. So that's, that's where a lot of people actually utilize annuities where it's treated like an investment. But they have riders on those, and those riders actually could provide guaranteed income, it could provide uh, death benefits, it could provide a number of these things, but make sure you understand what the costs are and the way the riders work. There's a great benefit of annuities for the right person. If you really, if you really are conservative and you feel that you're gonna live a long time and you really could benefit from a lifetime income over worrying about investments, this may be right for you. If you really wanna utilize some of these death benefits or living benefits that some of these provide, this might be right for you. If you really like the idea that it grows tax deferred inside this annuity, it may be right for you. If those things match up. If they don't match up, it might not be right for you. Maybe you should have done a normal traditional investment. So you need to make sure, because the cost versus the benefit has to be a true weighing. And there's been a lot of laws that have changed a lot recently to try to make sure that people are aware, whether they're being sold a product or whether they're evaluating it, that they truly understand that, that cost to benefit um, uh, exchange. And you know we've got clients that have them and we get a lot of clients that don't. And it just depends. I kind of call them the, the, the yellow school bus of, of investments. 
Most people drive cars and trucks. Most people. Most people invest directly in investments, mutual funds, stocks, whatever it is. Some people have school buses. Now, most of them are schools with kids and whatever. Well, guess what? They need school buses. It is very particular for a, a specific reason. And you could say the same with dump trucks or cement trucks. They're vehicles that are for a specific purpose. They are not vehicles for everybody. If you are a school bus driver, you may need a school bus. If you didn't drive to your uh, whatever, to, I typically say to your job today in a school bus, it's probably not right for you. These annuities are very similar. So when you have the right exact scenario, these are great, but many times they could be the wrong place based on um, misunderstanding of riders. General investment considerations, timeline, risk, to return, um, inflation, um, the return needed to achieve that accumulated goal. I talked a lot about that. Risk tolerance is a big deal. Um, we talk a lot about risk tolerance being that, um, what, what is somebody's pressure point? Like when the market dropped so dramatically this year, did, did you hit a pressure, a panic point where you're like, oh my gosh, I can't do this anymore. Well, we try, we want you to try to figure out what your panic point is and invest accordingly so you never hit it, right? It's like driving down the road. If you're, if you're turning in a turn and it, you're going 60 miles an hour, it doesn't feel comfortable. That's why they put those big yellow signs that say 30 miles an hour because it's safe and it's a comfortable speed for you to deal with this adjustment. Same thing with the stock market. It's volatile. It's going to go up and it's going to go down. And how you're comfortable with how much it goes up and down, you want to try to stay within that little envelope, that 30 miles an hour. If you like taking turns at 16, you know it's more dangerous. Well, at least it's nice to know that before you hit the turn. So it's real important to make sure that the risk and return and how that is tied to you as your comfort level is a good match. Now, remember, in retirement, your financial plan may not require you to take more risk. Right. If you're if if um, many times in retirement, they might only require you to be a moderate investor. You've been comfortable going 60 miles an hour your whole life. But in retirement, because you did such a good job saving, your, your plan may say, you know what, you don't have to be so risky anymore. If you're comfortable being more moderate, your plan is actually more successful because it's predictable. We get rid of those downside variables. And all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're managing it completely different than what you think you should. Not because you need to, but because it is just more comfortable and you can move forward with that. There are some people that are too conservative that have to take more risk. So it just depends on your situation. Uh, also, diversification down there. Um, one of the big problems we have, a lot of people get company stock or they overweighted in stock or they, they gained a lot of wealth in a particular stock, which is great. But at some point, it's no longer about making money, too much money, and it's more about preserving what you've made without that risk. Not to say we don't want to keep making money, but you want to do it in a diversify, maybe a little more defensive, a way that you can handle these downsides because you're, the time is shorter and we have to basically make sure that uh, we're protecting those assets. The role of insurance, there's a lot of areas here. We're gonna talk about these a lot in different programs, um, but making sure that what these are is if you're doing a trip you know, down to Florida and you find out one of the bridges is out, what's the plan? Well, if you're saving for retirement and all of a sudden you became disabled and you cannot work and earn the money that you expected, but you're still gonna have a retirement, what's your, what's your plan? How are you gonna get around this, this risk or this life event that derailed you a little bit? How are you gonna do it? We, we call them life events, divorce, death, illness, um, a lot of these things that have an impact on your life. And in retirement, the big one, long-term care. How are you going to deal with those costs? If you have enough assets, you can private pay. If you don't have any assets, you might rely on Medicaid. If you have some and you're in that 
middle area, you may need to ensure that. Everybody has a different need and different uh, uh, way of looking at that. So it's important to really uh, view it. Like we tell our clients, we don't care if you get it or don't get it. We just wanna make sure that you study it, understand it, and make an educated decision and live with the risk or live with the cost. Whatever you choose to do, we're fine with that. It's a matter of making sure that you understand it and that you made a decision and you just didn't let life happen to you and say, I wish I would have looked at that sooner or something like that. So implement your plan, develop your own roadmap. You know, this is real important. Make sure everybody's unique. What is your plan? Start it now. The earlier, the better. I don't care if you're 25, start it now. Especially if you're 10 years out, hence the program. You should have a plan 10 years out because there's so many things you can do within the last 10 years that you couldn't do or that you can't do one year out. So it's, it's real important to, uh, to have the, those options. Um, and review it regularly. Just because you did a plan 10 years out doesn't mean it's accurate five years later or even two years later. It really is important to make sure that you look at it regularly, make sure it matches with what you're trying to do. Um, and that's pretty much our discussion. One thing that I didn't put in here that I think is important is uh, estate planning. Um, this afternoon at uh, two o'clock on our daily program, we're actually gonna be talking to Russ, uh, the elder law. It's real important to make sure everybody understands the difference between wills, trust, uh, managing probate, managing their assets, how they're gonna distribute those, how they're gonna care and their, for their family to make that transition as easy as possible, whether you're caring for an aging parent or whether you are going to be that person and how you wanna leave that. Uh, beneficiaries um, between spouses, kids, second marriages, there's a lot of variables there. Healthcare powers of uh, attorney, directives, um, those are all legal documents that we really want to make sure that people think about. So I've got a couple minutes here. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to uh, take those now. Otherwise, thank you so much for listening in. Um, stay tuned and, and you know, come back as often as possible. And hopefully we can continue to have some great discussions. So I'll stick around to look for questions. Otherwise, have a great afternoon and have a great weekend.